والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم بسم الله الحمد لله you are watching lifting the fog clearing the misconceptions misunderstandings and the misrepresentations about Islam and all that it teaches. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes, and for the next few minutes we want to talk about a very important subject, one that's so important that we felt it was necessary to prepare this program dealing with the subject of the different groups that claim to all be the true Islam. The various sects or groups of Islam have been around for a long time, and it's necessary for us today to discuss it because of the type of emails that we've been receiving, letters and phone calls dealing with this subject. Let me read one to you now. It says, I have become a new Muslim, and I was told that I needed to join one of the groups, and I want to know which of the groups is the correct group. Which one should I join? And what would be the proof for it? Well, that's, <laughs> that's a good question. And that's why we're having this program today to, inshallah, God willing to come up with the correct answer for which is the correct group. I would like to mention that in Islam, it is not permissible for us to ever prevaricate or tell a lie. We have the truth and we have to always stick to it. In fact, a person can go to hell for lying in Islam. So therefore, well, I'd like to refer to the Quran, the teaching of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his speech, and he says in there, Ya yuladina amanu. And it means that for the believers, he's saying, O you who believe, you have to have taqwa for Allah, piety, righteousness, and always speak the truth. So a God-fearing person, one who really believes in Allah, must always deal with the truth, even if it's against himself. The next thing to mention is that Islam has the authentic proof the Qur'an and the teachings of Muhammad, peace be upon him, have all been preserved, authenticated, and we can refer to them today, just as we've done for this report we have for you. You can do so as well, and find that there is only one Islam, the Islam which came with Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, 1400 years ago. Now, having mentioned that, I would like to also let you know that there is something else in the beauty of Islam, and that is that we can be assured of the revelation of the Quran because it was memorized totally by Muhammad, peace be upon him, from the angel Gabriel. And then he in turn passed it on to his companions who also memorized it. They heard it, memorized it, and then they taught it to the next generations. So much so that today we have over 9 million who have memorized the Quran entirely. Now, if you can imagine even one person memorizing exactly what the Quran was 1,400 years ago, but we have over 9 million today totally and completely memorizing the Quran. And by the way, every single Muslim is memorizing at least a portion of the Quran in the original Arabic language, such as you just heard me recite. The other thing is the hadiths or teachings of Muhammad are also passed on in the same way. They were memorized and then passed on to the next generations. Additionally, these things were written down in the Arabic language. Some exist today from the very generations right after Muhammad, peace be upon him. So it's not like that we have to go by guesswork or something that somebody has in a dream or feelings or opinions. We can go to the original text and find out exactly what's been taught by the Quran and the Sunnah or the teachings of Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. Now, let us look to the actual teachings of these two sources and learn what this dividing up of Muslims is all about. I'd like to begin with the Quran, and Allah tells us in the Quran, Ya yulladina amanu, attaqallah haqtukatihi wa la tamutuna illa wa antum muslimun. Wa atasimu bi hablillahi jamia wa la taparku. More or less the meaning of it to English is that, O you who believe, be God-fearing and have righteousness or piety and give Allah His rights in this God-fearingness and do not die except as Muslims. The next part of the verse that I read to you from the next ayah, 
or verse of the Quran. It says, and hold fast all of you together to the rope of Allah. And don't separate. Don't divide. Don't go off into schisms. And this is a very, very important understanding coming straight from the Quran itself. So this indicates immediately that there is one rope of Allah. The rope of Allah, by the way, refers to what's called the deen. And in one of our other programs, we discuss this in detail, but suffice to say that deen in English needs more than the word religion. It encompasses much more. It is the way of life of the Muslims. Let me read to you something else from the Quran. And I want you to think about this. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajeem Wa la taakunu kalladhina tafaraku Wa aqtalifu min ba'di ma ja'ahumu bayna Wa ula'ika lahum madabun azim And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us And do not be like those people The people he's talking about before us Who divided up and argued amongst themselves after clear proofs had come to them, because it is for them a great and awful torment or punishment. So this, uh, by the way, is a, a very clear proof for us that dividing up and arguing amongst the Muslims over what the religion is, is not acceptable to Allah. I'd like to now look at uh, what the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, told us about this. He said, uh, remember one day you will appear before Allah and you're going to have to answer for your deeds. So beware, do not stray from the path of righteousness after I am gone. People, he says, people, no prophet or apostle, messenger, will come after me and no new faith will be born. Reason well, therefore, O people, and understand the words which I convey to you. He said, watch this, he said, I leave two things behind me. The Quran and the Sunnah. That means the Hadiths, that he, his teachings. And if you follow these, you will never go astray. In the Khutbah to Wada, which is known as the last big sermon of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, he stated, Muslims will divide into 73 groups. And all of these will be under the hell fire, except for one. The one that me and my companions are on today. This is a universal group of Islam that is based on the teachings found in the Quran and in the teachings of Muhammad called the Hadith or his Sunnah. And may Allah's peace and blessing be upon him. And he never said, that he was a Sunni, a Salafi, a Shiite, a Sufi, or any of the other names that we find today. Well, there may be a lot of truth in each one of these groups. The bottom line is that what we're saying, that he himself called us to be on what he was upon at his time. And he and his companions followed the Quran and his teachings without giving themselves any labels or titles. He also mentioned in another hadith or teaching, he said, both the legal and illegal things are clear, the haram and the halal. But in between them are doubtful or suspicious things, and most people have no knowledge about them. So whoever saves himself from these suspicious things saves his religion and his honor. And whoever indulges in these suspicious things is like a shepherd who grazes his animals too close to the private pasture of the king. And at any moment, he is liable to get into it. He then said, O people, beware. Every king has a hima or a boundary. The boundary of Allah on the earth is what is haram, or the illegal things. He says, beware, there's a piece of flesh in the body that if it becomes good or reformed, then the whole of the matter is good. But if it becomes spoiled, then the whole of the matter is ruined. And that piece of flesh is the heart. This is recorded in Sahih al-Bukhari. 
It's in volume 1, Hadith number 49. Now I'd like to examine some other important facts. And think for a moment and ask yourself about the word Islam. Does it appear in the text? Does it appear in the Holy Scripture of Islam? Do we find the word Islam in the Quran? Do we find the word Muslim in the Quran? Do we find these other words or other groups that have been mentioned uh, recently, do we find them in the Quran? Because if we find it in the Quran, obviously that would be authentic. But if we don't find it there, then how would we get any kind of evidence to support our view that this group or that group would be correct? Actually, the word Islam is in the Quran. We had a program all about the word Islam. Briefly, though, we said Islam comes from the root Salama. Islam means the surrender, submission, obedience, sincerity, and peace between you and Allah. And one who does Islam, it's a verb, you can see it's an action. So whoever does Islam would be an Islam-er in English. But of course, Arabic is not like English. You don't use the suffix er, er, after the verb. You use a prefix of meme or mu prior to the verb. Let me give you an example. When somebody travels, the word is suffer. And one who travels is a musafir. If somebody makes salah, he's praying, he's musalli. If he calls the adhan, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, the adhan, he is mu'adhan. So therefore, one who islams is a mu'islam. These words are in the Quran. And forms of it as well. Aslam, Istislam, Taslim, and Muslim. All We're finding all of these in the Quran. So therefore, if you said, well, I uh, follow the faith of Islam and I'm a Muslim, then this would be the correct thing. But if somebody come along and said, well, I'm in the, uh, this group called Ansar Allah, another group called the Five Percenters, uh, we have another group, they call themselves the Rastafarians, etc., I'm sure that we'll find good teachings amongst these groups because if they base it on the Quran and base it on some of the teachings of Muhammad, you're going to find good in it. But at the same time, we have to be careful and not label something as a group and then go off into different various sects or beliefs. So let's, uh, let's do this. Let's think about what we just said. We'll come back in a couple of minutes and go into it a little bit deeper. You're watching Lifting the Fog, removing the misconceptions and misrepresentations about Islam. My name is Sharif Tuni, and this is brought to you from Huda TV. Um, in today's edition, we'll be discussing about uh, the day and night. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala equated the samawat with darkness. The firmament with darkness and equated the earth with light. Why? Are there really pillars that cannot be seen? Or is it an unseen uh, pillar? Everything is running, but the relationships are fixed. Yes. So that it would appear to people as if nothing is running, you see. We are destroying the, our environment with our own hands. And that's why the Quran says, Bismillah, alhamdulillah. You're watching Lifting the Fog, Removing the Misconceptions, Misunderstandings, and the Misrepresentations of Islam and what it teaches. In our earlier segment, we were discussing the various groups or sects that have broken off and still claim to be the true Islam. But we discovered from the Quran and the teachings of Muhammad that in fact, the only group that will be acceptable to Allah is the group that is on what Muhammad and his companions were on 1400 years ago. Peace and blessing be upon him. I'd like now to refer to something else in the Quran when Allah tells us about how to resolve our various differences. And it's a very important verse from the Quran because it actually claims that there is no iman, no faith, unless a person adheres to this particular order. Listen to what Allah says. He's telling Muhammad something. He says, but know by your Lord 
They have no iman or faith until they make you, Muhammad, as a judge between them in all the matters wherein they dispute. And then they find no resistance in themselves against your decision. And they accept with full taslima, which means submission, another word coming out of the word Islam. Incidentally, the word for submission in Arabic, taslima, is related to Aslam, Islam. And they all are the, from the same root. I want to now discuss what Allah says that He will accept and what He won't accept from those who claim to be Muslims. He tells us in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 19. I'll read it for you. Inshallah. وَمَمْ يَبْتَغِي غَيْرُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَ فَلَنْ يُكْبَلَا مِنْهُمْ وَهُوَ فِي الْأَخِيرْتِ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ And whoever wants a way of life other than submission to Allah, he will never accept it from them and in the hereafter those people will be with the losers. He also tells us that whoever Allah wills to guide, He opens their chest to Islam. And whoever He lets go astray, He makes their chest constricted as though they were climbing high up into the sky. And so Allah puts the wrath on those who don't believe. This is in chapter 6, verse 125. Allah also said, Is he whose chest is opened to Islam by Allah, so that he is in the light of his Lord, like those who don't believe, those whose hearts are hardened against the remembrance of Allah. And he says they are in plain error. You'll find this in chapter 39, verse 22. He also asks us in Surah Asa, and who does more wrong than the one who invents a lie against the law when he is being called to Islam? Verily, Allah says, and this is a quote that Muslims say, Verily, my salat, my sacrifice, my living and my dying are for Allah, the Rabbil Alameen, the Lord of the worlds. He has no partner. And of this I have been commanded, and I am the first of those who submit. And the word in Arabic, Muslims, those who submit to Allah's will. For those of you who are followers of Christianity or other religions, you perhaps have heard of this idea of various groups splitting off and each one claiming to be the right group. And now I would like to read to you something that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, told us. In a beautiful hadith or saying, he said that he had prayed and he had asked Allah for three things, but he was only granted two of them. He said that he first asked that the nation of Muslims would not be destroyed by being outnumbered. He said Allah granted that prayer. He said he then asked Allah that his nation of Muslims would not be destroyed from poverty. And he said Allah also granted that prayer. He said that in the third prayer that he asked that the nation of Muslims not be destroyed by dividing amongst themselves and fighting amongst themselves. He said, but Allah did not grant his request in that prayer. Additionally, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Muslims would divide into 73 groups. All will be in hell except one, as we mentioned in our earlier segment. And he said, the one that me and my companions are on today. And this actually leaves us with no decision in the matter. There is only one Islam. There's only one kind of Muslim. What we see from the deviant groups is always that they're going to have some way to distinguish themselves from other groups. So they're going to have to come up with a name for themselves. From this, we'll begin to see a pattern. Now, if somebody feels it's necessary to describe themselves as a particular kind of a Muslim, such as a small Muslim or a tall Muslim, this only describes their physical attributes. But when a person begins to describe their belief or their iman or their way in Islam as being something different from another group and they have to give these descriptive adjectives to themselves, then we see that this pattern is becoming something more than just physical characteristics or a nationality determining where somebody's from. Well, such as somebody might say, I'm a Arab Muslim or I'm a Pakistani Muslim. We could understand that. But when they describe their Islam as being different than somebody else's Islam, then that's where the problem would come in. 
I want to read to you something that Allah said in the Quran. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim. Al-yawmu akmautu lakum dinukum wa admamtu alaykum nitmati wa raditulukum islam adina. Allah says, on this day have I perfected for you your way of life and conferred my biggest favor upon you and have chosen for you to submit to me in al-Islam. This was one of the last verses of the Quran revealed. And we have to understand that it is Allah who made it perfectly clear, both in the Quran and with the sayings of his Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that the way of Islam is perfected and complete during the lifetime of Muhammad, peace be upon him. That there's no religion going to come after it until the last day. And that those who follow Islam will be called by Allah Muslims, as they were called in the Quran. Whoever would add to or take away from this deen or this way of life, in fact, would be of a deviant sect or group. And there is a hadith, a saying of Muhammad, wherein he took a stick and he drew a straight line in the dirt. And then he said, this is the straight path to Allah. Then he drew angles or lines off of the main line. He said, these are the deviant groups or sects going out of Islam. And every one of them has a devil, a shaitan, calling to it. So, from this we can see that each of these so-called faith groups that we mentioned in our early part of the program today have been labeled by mainstream scholars as being deviant groups or sects for the reason that they have actually come up with something new, either adding to or taking away from what was revealed 1,400 years ago. Let me explain this now in really simple English terms. If a person wants to do what God wants them to do, and they want to give up their own passions and desires and lusts, asking for God's will to be done here on earth, as it is in heaven, then in the essence they're saying, I want Islam the submission to God on his terms. Whoever does that is a Muslim, as we mentioned in the earlier part of the segment. It's as simple as that. It's mentioned also in the Bible that this is how Jesus asked his followers to pray, to ask for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We know as Muslims that everything submits to God on his terms. For instance, Everything that's created by God does what He wants it to do. The sun is in an orbit or a pattern that God has ordained. Likewise, the moon is also in its orbit following God's plan or His orders. The earth and everything on it is following God's orders, submitting to God's will. Even the animals and the birds and the fish in the sea obey the commandments of Allah. There's nothing that they do of their own free will. In this way, they are automatically considered as Islam or Muslim. They're doing what God wants them to do. If we understand that concept, then you know why Muslims say that everything in creation submits to God or is Muslim. And you wouldn't imagine in your mind that the sun would ask the moon such a question as, what kind of Muslim are you? This wouldn't make any sense. And it also doesn't make any sense for Muslims to divide themselves up into these various groups, disputing amongst themselves and going against the very words of Allah in the Quran, and yet still claiming to be this kind of a Muslim or that kind of a Muslim. I'd like to wrap this segment up by telling you a little story. And this story is one that makes a lot of sense to me and I hope that it will be a benefit to all of us. The story goes something like this, that there was a big enemy, a group of people who wanted to overtake a Muslim village. But the problem that they had was that the Muslims couldn't be defeated. The enemies attacked them from many ways, but they couldn't break their spirit and they couldn't get through their walls until one of the enemy decided, let me go and join them and fight them from within. So he did. 
he went in and he said, I want to be with you guys. They said, well, come on. And when he came in, he said, I'd like to be a Muslim. They said, great. He said, I want to learn about Islam. They said, welcome. So he would sit in the circles or halakas at night and listen to the teachers of Islam explaining various things. Then one night, one of the scholars was explaining the story of the people in the cave in Surah Kahath. The story, and it's in, by the way, chapter 18, if you want to look it up in the Quran, the story is about the sleepers in the cave, and it tells that they had a dog with them, a kalb. So he listened intently. When the scholar was through speaking, he raised his hand and he said, you know, I want to ask a question. They said, okay, Fuddle, go ahead, what's your question? He said, well, can I ask, I, I'm a new uh, Muslim and I don't know a lot, can I ask about the dog? The scholar said, certainly go ahead. He said, I'd like to know what color was the dog. Can I ask that question? He said, of course. He says, the dog was a white dog. He said, oh, okay. Then the next night he went to another place with another halakha with a different scholar. And he said, can I ask a question? They said, sure, go ahead. He said, my question is regarding the color of the dog in the Quran in chapter 18. He said, what color was that dog? The scholar said, the dog was black. And he said, I see, okay. Then he went back to the first group and he said, by the way, the scholar on the other side of town said, the dog is black. You said he's white. Which color is he? The first scholar said, no, I defend my position. This dog is a white dog. The second scholar says, no, this dog is a black dog. And they began to argue back and forth. And the people following the one scholar said, the dog is white. The other people following the other scholar said, no, the dog is black. They began to fight amongst themselves and hitting and killing each other. And when that happened, then the enemy went back outside and told his friends, we can now take them because you see they're fighting amongst themselves. We can defeat them. And they did. And they won over the Muslims because of this division. So we'll close with a little prayer and ask Allah to keep us away from these divisions, which certainly will bring to ruination ourselves here and in the hereafter. We pray for Allah for His guidance to guide us to the Surat Mustaqim, the straight path. You've been watching Clearing Away the Fog. Until next time, Salaamu Alaikum Warahmatullah. Oh, oh, oh.